Salim Muhammad and Abdullah and Ali was Sahbi Ajmain. I would like to thank Servi for their very sponsoring this important meeting, and I would like to thank Saudi Arabia Association for their support for this scientific session. As we know, hypertension is very common worldwide, and uh, we are dealing with daily, our daily practice uh, for patients we see every day how to manage them. And we are very pleased tonight to discuss hypertension from guidelines to clinical practice. I have really the great pleasure and honor to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker will be uh, Professor Abdel Halim Tinsara. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Cardiology President of Saudi Group for in, uh, Echocardiography, Director for the Cardiology Fellowship Program at the uh, Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. He's uh, working at King Saud bin Abdelaziz University for Health Sciences. He's a uh, really well known worldwide, country wise, scientific researcher and speaker. He will address to us a very important topic about the guidelines. As you know, we have guidelines worldwide. We have our local guidelines, we have our American Heart Association guidelines, we have American Diabetic Association guidelines, and we have European Association guidelines. So Dr. Abdel, uh, Professor Abdel Halim will go us over all this uh, really in summary to tell us how we can use these guidelines and our management for daily patients. Dr. Abdel Halim, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Arafa. Uh, okay. Can you see my slide? Not yet. Uh, now we started, sure. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbi alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. What I'm going to talk today, actually, uh, we have recently uh, a published guideline. This has been published in May 2020, and this has been referred to all the other guidelines that Professor Arafa mentioned. So I think that should really give us an insight because they reference to the European guideline of 2018 and the American guideline as well. So hypertension remains the leading cause of death globally. It accounts for 10 million deaths per year. In each, uh, in, in, in the, uh, we're going to have 1.3 billion newly hypertensive. And what is worse, that is hypertension, which was uh, common among a uh, high uh, income group, has now moved to import uh, the low income group. These are people who do not have readily access to, med to medical service, or they don't have access to medication, uh, which is much worse. And you have to choose a low cost medication for them. Now, in the high income, the estimated is around 0.4 million, while in the low income, it is 1.1 billion. So this tell you how the magnitude of this problem. Now, the other thing, hypertensive do not come alone. Hypertensive has all these risk factors are associated with it. And this is why Professor Arfa in his lecture, he's going to elaborate on these different aspects and will tell us that is hypertensive or hypertension is not a mere figure. It is more than a figure. We should treat the patient as a whole, considering all his risk factor, because all this risk factor will decide if we're going to stick to lifestyle modification or we're going to move immediately to medication. And the European says included the patient for some disease, they will consider a very high risk group, not a high risk, a very high risk group. And I think this is very important, that is we're going to hear about. Now, what is also a challenging in hypertension? that is less than 50% of these hypertensive people are receiving blood pressure lowering medication. So this is another challenge that is in our face. 
Now they diagnose this in this international society guideline. They use this uh, definition of more than 140. But what if it's what they focus in this guideline is the importance of having repeated measurement, which is again a very important thing. So whenever we have a diagnosis, we should have two to three office visits, depending on the, high, the uh, degree of the blood pressure. So if the blood pressure was higher, then we need a closer visit. And this is another important. The only said you can diagnose by a single visit if your blood pressure is really sky high. And I think this is very important because hypertension is a disease that is going to stick with you the rest of your life. So you have to be really very sure about it. Like the other guideline, they really put a lot of weight on out of office blood pressure measurement, whether the ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure measurement or home measurement, which is again, a very important tool to do. Now, the other important thing, we, we are still in 2020, and they put this slide. And I beg you, I see, mashallah, tabarakallah, big number of people at TV. If you ask how many of them, they fulfill this criteria, you will get surprised. He's starting from back supported, not talking, the appropriate cuff size, the arm base, even the feet. Then you get more quiet room, comfortable temperature, no smoking coffee or exercise for the last 30 minutes. Our patient is too far away and they come run to catch the appointment. Empty bladder, relax for three to five minutes, nursing a rush to take blood pressure measurement. Take three measurement at one minute interval and use the last two measurements. So a lot of things really before we can claim, yes, this patient is hypertensive. But mind you, all that have to be done at least two to three times. So this tell you, one of the things also was very interesting, the use of, uh, the considering the measurement of the next circumference because of the, uh, uh, close relationship between hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, which is a very important thing that is we should consider nowadays when assessed. And this is why we told you hypertension is not a mere uh, figure. That is to say we need to address. And of course, we need to look for the end organ damage, which is again, a very important. And I think we are good for that. And again, for the assessment, they said, please check blood pressure in both arms simultaneously. A natural difference could exist up to 10 millimeter mercury, but you need to intervene if the difference was more than 20 millimeter mercury. If you suspect a postural drop, then please repeat your blood pressure one minute and three minutes after, uh, when these people have symptoms. Or in the elderly who are diabetic because they are prone to have the complication of orthostatic hypotension. The classification is still the same standard. Looking, uh, putting a patient like high normal, grade one, grade two. And as I told you, the emphasis on the out office blood pressure measurement or home blood pressure, blood pressure measurement. And of course they list a list of uh, medical condition that is you might need uh, to consider to consider doing this ambulatory blood pressure. So again, this is a very important really to, to consider. And I think uh, is uh, the home blood pressure measurement should not be an, an, a difficult issue. And especially you have a, a blood pressure measure, uh, machines that is what only 100 and maybe even less. And this is the value for, for whether the home or the blood pressure. And as you see, it's for the 24 hour averaging is 130 over 80. Now, the um, measurement of the risk factor is again, as we said earlier, is very important. And 
uh, measuring the blood pressure at different uh, um, intervals is very important. And always the confirmation is an essential part in this disease. One of the things also they mentioned, which is again interesting, the seasonal variation in the blood pressure. So there is a difference. So you have lower level blood pressure when you have high temperature. So in our cities, we might have this variation in the blood pressure or a seasonal variation, which is again, to have, we have to look for that. And the difference could reach up to five systolic or three diastolic millimeter mercury. So again, please consider this seasonal variation or temperature variation. The list of the diagnostic imaging is, is included certain investigation like carotid ultrasonograph, ultrasound. But of course, this is when you assess a patient as a vasculopath. Always please consider the secondary causes of hypertension and you might look, need to look to the renal artery. The fundoscopy is an important bedside test that is we unfortunately underutilize. We used in the past part of the internal medicine exam. Now I think it's no more even become a routine. So, but this is really have to consider it. And of course we might do brain CT MRI if the patient have cerebrovascular accident. The other clinical uh, test, which is very important, the ankle brachial index. Uh, and, and unfortunately, majority of us do not even have a Doppler ultrasound in the clinic. We have it only in the world, which is again a very important thing that is we need uh, to, to consider. And in, the, in addition, of course, uh, in a certain situation, based on the clinical, you might go for secondary hypertension. Now, the management, it's all consistent through the guideline. Always please go with a uh, lifestyle modification. Lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle in all across the different degree of hypertensive, whether stage one or stage two, complicated, non-complicated, end organ damage, no organ damage, all that should be your first step. In certain situations, you might start immediately with antihypertensive depending on the risk factor, or you might be rating and you see what is your response with your lifestyle modification. They put a, a term which is essential versus optimal. And in this here, they said the essential, that is you need to reduce the blood pressure by at least 20 systolic or 10 diastolic, or ideally less than 140 or 490. But if you're speaking about the optimal, then you have should go more than less than 130 or 480. And here they said, okay, you again, you see, you need to, to assess your risk factor, including chronic kidney disease, diabetes, history of end organ damage. And then you might go if, if this have uh, the drug availability and, and you decided to go either in this pathway, which is essential versus the optimal. When you have the grade two, then in that case, you might go directly for the hypertensive, anti-hypertensive uh, treatment. Now, in the going for the medication, it's still like the uh, standard uh, pathway, going first, starting with uh, angiotensin receptor blocker or uh, ARP, or plus minus uh, calcium channel blocker. As you see from the beginning, they recommend the combination. So unlike the traditional or the management in the past, we start with single. Now from the stage one, they recommend combination. However, this will be at a low doses from each drug. If that did not achieve your target, then you move to a full dose of, again, combination. So this is again a very important change in the concept of management. That is we have really to focus on to achieve the control of the blood pressure. In stage three, again combination. Now the combination here adding a diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide or non-hydrochlorothiazide, but again the concept in combination. Later on, you might consider in a top of that 
the drug which is like spironolactone, which is again a very important drug, which has been very useful and always to help in, 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 in this patient to have resistant hypertension. And as a matter of fact, many of the guidelines, they, they said you cannot consider resistant hypertension until you utilize the spironolactone. So this is a closer view to what we mentioned earlier. And as I told you, the focus always, you see in all these four, the word, the magic word combination. Now they created this algorithm. It's, it's, it's a kind of busy slide, but what's more the importance of it, they divided diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, and monitor. And, and, and they classify the patient depending on the value blood pressure and also the uh, risk factor that is associated with his uh, blood pressure. And they decided if you'd like to go just purely in the lifestyle modification or you go on the line of medication. This is a closer view of what I mentioned earlier. And again, even in this, the importance of rechecking two to three times of his visit is, has been more elaborated and more emphasized. Uh, the, again here, one of the thing here for the black uh, patient, they said from the stage one, you might add cyazide or cyazide like diuretics. So this is they give you a, a, a third option as a first line therapy in black uh, patient because you know, they have less um, response to ARP or this receptor blocker. Now, one of the things which is also they focus, which is again a very important thing, is the concept of adherence. Because this is one of the major challenges that is we face in our daily practice. Adherence is always a challenge. So as a important focus on the taking medication, following a diet, following a low salt, doing the daily exercise, all that are very important measures that is uh, uh, affect your your uh, outcome. And they're saying that is non-adherence to antihypertensive treatment might affect up to 80%. So depending on the community. Uh, so it's varied between 10 to 80%. So it's quite high. And I think this is why they focus on a lot of adherence. And they give a different uh, modality in how you can improve your adherence starting from um, reducing the polypharmacy by using a single pill combination. Once daily dosing over these drugs, that you have to take them more than once. And also uh, checking uh, with the behavior of the patient. As a matter of fact, I attended the, a session where they involve in that here is a psychiatric or psychotherapy with them, because this is a very important. Now the home blood pressure monitor is, has been also becoming a very important concept because the patient family can help you, especially nowadays people are very educated. You have the social media who can direct the patient how to do the appropriate blood pressure measurement. There is a social contact with the physician. So that is a very important concept. A reminder of the backing of the medication. There are certain pharmacists to call the patient when they, their medications are due. They're checking their supplies. I think this is a very important empowerment based counseling, which is again very important. Electronic adherence, such mobile phone, I think this should really become a, 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 a very use, a friendly approach to ensure adherence. And the role of pharmacists cannot be overemphasized to improve this because really they are the one who see what is the patient had. And sometimes the patient get confused, especially when we are using the same medication from a different companies. Sometimes he find it his antihypertensive white, sometimes it's yellow. If this was not explained to him, then, then, then some of your effort will be wasted. Now this is, has been done in a four uh, Mediter uh, Middle East countries, including Saudi Arabia. And you see the prevalence of uh, uh, hypertensive, awareness, treatment, and control. And you see the control, okay, only 19%. And this is like we said, only 50% are treated. And this is applied in our Middle East and particularly uh, in Saudi Arabia. 
So why we do fail in hypertensive management? I think the, we need to underestimate, because we're underestimating the challenges. We're underestimating the, the concept of taking the patient and focus on a figure. Uh, we also, we are not considering that is not easy to uh, stick medication. We think one or two medication is easy. And uh, if, if everybody just tested himself when he prescribed an antibiotics, he understand how difficult in a patient if we have 17 tablets that is you have to take per day. And also uh, continuation of all the strategy by starting one medication or waiting for three to six months till the patient come back to readjust his medication and leaving the patient for all this time without uh, a follow-up. Now, this has been focusing since 2013, but what is the difference now? You see combination, 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 but what is different now is this, the target become less, in one side, and more importantly, uh, more important, this is one slide that is also I'd like to address in the, addressing the target. We have always to consider the age in 60 to, five, to 55 to 80 years, we can list, have less target than people less than 65 because they are more prone to have the postural uh, dizziness. Uh, and what was important is, is really to have this concept always attending in our approach to the patient. So we have always to take a faster blood pressure control. We should not wait for the patient for use single bell. All that is very important. What happened in 2018, the initial combination was not addressed in stage one. Well, yes in 2018 and class one. In stage two, it was weak, now become a strong recommendation. And, and also in the initial combination in eligible patient, it was in 43 now in 85%. And I think this is very important concept that is we have always to, to consider. Addressing the risk factor will be addressed by Professor Arfa, but I think always what we see, this is all our class one. And I think it's very important to, to remember. Now, one of the things which is also related to hypertension, that is the use of aspirin, is not recommended for primary prevention. It's not recommended for primary prevention in hypertensive patient without cardiovascular disease. So again, this is a very important to, to, to remember. So really in summary, I think the most important that is the classification really did not change much. However, we have the novel element in cardiovascular risk certification and not focus on the figure. There is a wider recommendation in the use of out of office blood pressure and also home blood pressure measurement. Now they are focusing in lower treatment target in people less than 160, uh, 65 of years uh, of age, you go less than uh, 120. And we have the newer drug treatment strategy that is include combination from the aerial phase, starting with a lower dose combination to full dose combination or to triple combination. The adherence, which is very important, that is you have really to, to get all our resources including the pharmacists, behavioral changes, including our uh, um, social media, including mobile devices. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdel Halim Kinsara. Really, we enjoyed your talk and uh, I'm very, very pleased that you go ahead of me so that you make my life very easy now, okay? Now, I'm going to uh, address for you a very important topic actually, uh, let me put my slide back here, yes. I am Muhammad Arafa from University, uh, Saudi University, uh, working in, uh, in cardiology for the last uh, 40 years. So I'm just going to implement my, my own view about hypertension. It's really a disease that I lived with you and with him for the last 40 years. I did my first study on hypertension 
1978, and we found the prevalence of hypertension at that time was 5% only. And now we are talking about 30, 35%. When we talk about hypertension, we should just not say this number or that number. Basically, hypertension is a patient so that has hypertension. And that patient should be dealt with as a whole, studying all his risk factors, telling him what is the target for our management and what we should do for him for the coming years to come. Now, my agenda will be basically discuss some of the uh, issues have been already enlightened by Professor Abd uh, Halim. I will talk about factor influencing the cardiovascular risk factor, 10 years cardiovascular risk categories, and then uh, how we define hypertension according to the office and home measurement, and uh, finally, what are the cornerstone antihypertensive medication for us. As you heard that uh, cardiovascular disease is still number one killer worldwide. And if we compare it to the other diseases, unfortunately, heart diseases is killing more people than anything else, even more than COVID and even more than other infections like HIV, more than diabetes and more than cancer. And hypertension has remained throughout from the 90s, 2010, up to now, the major contributor for this cardiovascular disease. So the hypertension worldwide is very common and it is coming, it's really remaining the most common cause for, as, as you know. Now, as you heard from Dr. Abdel Halim, the prevalence uh, of, of hypertension in the, in the area here is about 33%. Unfortunately, half of the patients are not aware about their hypertension. That means, despite that we have so common disease, almost half don't know that they have hypertension. And when we go to those who have hypertension, only half of them are on treatment. So despite that they know they are hypertensive, half of them only on treatment. And the control is about 20%. So really we are under diagnosing the disease, under treating and under controlling it. So we have to do something about it. We cannot continue like that for our patient management. We have to have, have more diagnosis, more treatment and more control for sure. So what are the factors that influence cardiovascular risk in patients with hypertension? What are these factors that we have to assess in patients when we interview them in the clinic for the first time and for follow-up? Now, definitely you have to know about his age because age matters in management and in risk factors. Smoking, uh, uh, total cholesterol, HDL, uric acid, his diabetes, uh, his body weight and his uh, basement bas bas index as well as his family history of cardiovascular disease. You have to know about his uh, family history of hypertension or prenatal history of uh, new early onset of hypertension, as well as about early onset menopause for ladies, their lifestyle, their social, social, psychosocial status, and their socioeconomic factors, and their heart rate at rest. Heart rate at rest is really a marker of our heart activity and our fitness as a whole. So what are the organs that involved in hypertension when the hypertension affects the body? Definitely arterial stiffening is one of the important factor. If your patient has a wide pulse pressure, especially in older beer, more than 60 millimeter mercury, he's really at, at a really very stiff vessels. And that's why we see in elderly, they have systolic hypertension and the diastolic pulse pressure in the low 60s while they have blood pressure in 160 itself. Now, carotid femoral wave uh, measurement and assessment, as you heard, the ECG for LBH is not very really common to see changes in the ECG in hypertension basin, but if you see it, it's really a marker of, of organ involvement. ECO is more sensitive to check it, and then don't forget always to check your urine for microalbuminuria and elevated albumin creatine ratio. Um, whether it's CKD with GFR between 30 to 59, and uh, the, the involvement of peripheral vascular disease with ankle brachial index less than 0.9, and then as we heard from Professor Abd Halim, advanced cytonopathy, all these are really sign of bad outcome in hypertensive patients. Hypertrophy, for example, is a marker of mortality from cardiovascular disease, hypertension with hypertrophy is a marker of arrhythmia. Hypertension with hypertrophy is a marker of heart failure, as you will hear. Now, once you have established cardiovascular disease, it's really too far now. We are talking about cardiovascular disease established 
like ischemic stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, TIA, myocardial infarction. If you have a hypertensive patient with having all these diseases, it is a very high risk, and then you have to start to think about the treatment early as much as possible. Presence of atheroma plaque on imaging, heart failure, including heart failure with the reserve rejection fraction, and this is a very common problem in supraphoronationity. The patient come with, with dyspnea on mild effort, and yet his, his ejection fraction is normal, but if you look at his diastolic function, it's really very impaired. Peripheral vascular disease, atrial fibrillation is another marker of, of bad outcome, and then severe kidney diseases. Now, if we put these really in, 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 in way to categorize our patient, the risk to certify them, we have to really put our patient in four classes. Very high risk patient, or high risk patient, moderate risk, and low risk. So who are these very high risk patients? Those who have clinical cardiovascular disease, as I just mentioned, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, those who have stroke, TIA, RTV, aortic aneurysm, peripheral vascular disease, and look at diabetic. Diabetic with target organ damage, proteinuria are high, very high risk, with major risk factors such as grade three hypertension or high cholesterol, severe kidney diseases. These are patients really don't need to be really categorized. They are already at high risk. And the same thing for very high risk patient and high risk, the, the, the patient need to be reached started treatment right away as we'll see. Now, what are the risk modifiers that increase risk for, for the score which we use? The social deprivation, if the patient is really deprived of his, his care, those who have obesity and their high, high central obesity especially, physical inactivity, psychological stresses, family history, autoimmune disease and inflammatory disorder, major psychiatric disorder, all these are really factors influencing the outcome as well as the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So once we have the patient certified to low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or very high risk, then you can look at his stage of hypertension and look at his number as figure here, grade one, two, grade three hypertension. And you can see those who are at very high risk, we have to start treatment as early as low pressure. Even if their pressure 130 and they are very high risk, we have to start the treatment. We should not wait till their pressure more than 140. So according to your risk profile, according to the patient status, according to his, his uh, uh, let's say, uh, comorbidities, then you have to start with treatment as early as possible. So those who are really need to be treated as early as possible are very high risk and high risk patient, even if they have low risk factors, but high grade of hypertension, or they have low blood pressure and still have many high comorbidities. As I said earlier, cardiovascular assessment with score system is recommended for hypertensive patients who are not at very high risk due to established cardiovascular disease or renal disease. These are meant for those who have not yet established the cardiovascular disease or renal diseases. And as you heard from uh, Dr. Abdul Harim, we have to know the, the, the blood pressure abnormality in different way. Office measurement, usually we consider 140 over 90 is to be abnormal or higher. While ambulatory blood pressure measurement for the daytime should be one more than 130 or 85, nighttime from 120 to 170 and higher, and the mean blood pressure 130 over 80 for those average 24. Home, uh, mean blood pressure, one more, one, more than 135 over 85. So you have to put your pressure threshold that you need to know in order to start treatment of patient according to the blood pressure measurement, whether done at home, whether done at daytime measurement, 24 hours, or day by the office measurement. Why we need the home pressure measurement? Because we have conditions like white cone syndrome, that patient comes to the hospital and his pressure high when we go home. When he goes home, his pressure come, come back to normal. And uh, so market elevation of, of office pressure measurement need to be assessed. Those who have mass hypertension, for example, they have high normal in the office, but when they, when they go to home, they have high pressure measurement. Normal office pressure in the individual with already developed the uh, hypertension mediated organ damage, or they have very high risk, then we have to know the, the pressure at home. Postural hypertension and postprandial hypertension that we need to assess it as well. 
and for evaluation of resistant hypertension. Now, this is an example of a monitored patient who come to, to the clinic. Basically, he had high normal. When we attached for him the monitor 24 hours, you can see throughout the day, his pressure from nine o'clock in the morning throughout, his pressure above the target, one more than 140. Only the time when he go to sleep, his, he had nine external dipping normal, but when he woke up, again, his pressure. So really, he's under stress, and most of the time, his pressure is high and need to be treated. So home assessment is very important. And to assess the, 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 the hypertension with the organ damage, we can use the ECG for us. And as I said, it's health, but it's not very sensitive. Unit assessment is very essential, and checking the GFR is very important, and fendoscopy is very important. Now. Echocardiography can help, uh, but it's not available everywhere, but it's very, 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 very useful method of measurement, the hypertrophy and the gastric dysfunction. Thyroid ultrasound is very important as well. Abdominal ultrasound, a pulse wave doubler, and the, the peripheral assessment of, of wave doubler in the, the ankle and the brachial. And cognitive function of the patient is important. And finally, brain imaging can help us in defining the, the home, the, uh, uh, hypertension mediated organ damage. Now, these methods, they have, some of them are, have low sensitivity in checking. For example, left ventricular hypertrophy by ACG is very low sensitivity, but it's very reducible. And if you want to see the changes, you should do, wait for six months before you expect that the patient blood pressure control has reduced his hypertrophy. For the echo, it's, it's have moderate sensitivity for changes. It's moderate reproducibility and operator dependent. But again, you have to wait for more than six months to see any changes in the echo before you decide the patient is responding or not. Uh, left ventricular hypertrophy by uh, uh, cardiac MRI is very highly sensitive and very reproducible. And again, we have to wait for six months before that. So you can select your modality that you have at, at the facility and see how it's sensitive and how it's reducible and what is the time for changes. Now, as I said earlier, the age is very important. If your patient is between the age of 18 and 65 and his pressure is 180, 140 over 90, you have to start treatment. It's one A recommendation. Any patient between the age of 18 and 65 and his blood pressure is 140 over 90, his treatment should be started. Age between 65 and 79, again, it should be, more, if the blood pressure more than 170 or more than 140 over 90, you should start treatment. However, if the age, age of the patient is more than 80, then you have really to wait till his pressure is defined to be more than 160 over 90, and then you start treatment. But if you have a patient with very high risk factor, then you have to start blood pressure measurement, uh, measurement before he's reached 140, above 135 over 85, and it should be recommended that consider for treatment of hypertension because this patient has very high expression. The target, as uh, you heard from uh, Professor uh, Abdel Harim, it is very really, uh, different uh, according to the status of the patient. But if you look at diabetic, it should be less than 130, and preferably if you really can reach to, to the uh, 130, less than that, it would be better. For those who have the disease, it's well tolerated as well. So always try to be less than 130 for your target and your management. Now, not below 120 for sure, but if your patient is around 125, 130, it definitely would be better according to the age and according to his cardiac status. Those who are really for diastolic hypertension should be between 70 and 79 for all of the patients. So if you look at different guidelines and their targets, the American College and American Heart, they say it should be one, less than 130 over 80. The European Society of Cardiology and the European Society of Hypertension, they say it should be less than 130 over 80. It's well tolerated. The NICE a British uh, recommendation should be less than 140 over 90. The Korean one is one, 140, less than 140 and, uh, over 90, as high expectation should be less than 130. The Canadian one should be less than 120, and I, I prefer myself to go with the Canadian because if we aim for, for 120 and we reach 130, it's good. In our kingdom here, the, the target has been both less than 140 over 90.
Now, if you look at the nice line lines, what is our motivation for treatment of hypertension? It's really, we are treating a condition with asymptomatic and the patient have no symptoms in order to, to do what? To prevent mortality and morbidity. So we have to really sit down with the patient and tell him that your disease now is a, asymptomatic disease. You have no symptoms, but it's a silent killer. Unless, unless you start to work on it from now, you're going to have major damage organ in your organs, and this will be uh, led to the more mortality and morbidity in the future. So we have to have the motivation with the patient in order for him to stick to his treatment and be compliant with it. Unless we have good motivation, unless we have to sit down with him and explain to him the value of the medication and should be long-term therapy. It's not like one week. Now, many patients come and ask me, can we stop medication? Yes, you can stop medication if you reduce your weight, if you exercise, if you reduce all risk factors. We have many patients who have morbid obesity and they went for gastric bariatric surgery. And after one month of their weight reduction, I can tell you that most of the medication we stop and the patient can live normally without medication if they comply with their lifestyle modification. And as you heard from Professor Abd Halim, always lifestyle modification is number one way for us. Now, as you hear, the combination therapy is really the way to go. But which combination we should use? The uh, angiotensin system inhibitor are really coming very strong. And they are becoming the cornerstone for hypertension management. And they are coming in the first line, ACE or ARBs, there. And we can use them as monotherapy for grade one hypertension, if the stroke pressure is less than 150, and the patient is, is very old, so we can use monotherapy. But usually we like to go for initial dual therapy, especially if we have systolic pressure more than 20 in our measurement and diastolic more than 10, then you should start your initial therapy with combination, and then you can add more uh, to do our medication by maximizing the therapy and then add diuretics again in single in order to reach. And once you reach the resistant hypertension in stage three, then you can think about adding spiralactone at this stage. Now, always in one pill. So, what is the ideal uh, RAS system or inhibition of the renal angiotensin system? It should be really used in various clinical conditions and should be useful in different age group and should be available in combination with several drugs, and should be available in single bill combination. And finally, and the most important one, it should be supported by evidence-based medicine. So we have to have a drug which is really known in studies that is safe and can be reducing blood pressure and can improve the outcome of the patient without complication. And uh, the angiotensin receptor blocker are one of the really the one of them, and we'll talk about now the, the, the ACE inhibitor, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And as you know, the, the, the one, one of the important ones we, we're using so many years now is the brindobril. Brindobril is most studied ACE inhibitor and consistent with really reducing morbidity and mortality in patients beyond blood pressure reduction. So we have studies in, in diabetes, in, in advanced trial, involving more than 11,000 patients, hypertension with diabetes. And then we have uh, studies on, on patients without hypertension in ASCO trial, involving more than 20,000 patients, and this showed difficulty to be involved. We have studies in patients with stable coronary artery disease in Europa trial, involving more, more than 12,000 patients. And we have post-stroke patients more than 6,000 patients in progress trial. And we have post my patients in study as well and the historic heart failure patient. So brindobril has been studied throughout the cycle from patients who had risk factors to patients who had atherosclerosis to patients who had myocardial infarction, those who have already established stroke, those who have arrhythmia and loss of muscle and remodeling has been improvement with such patients. And if we look at the comparison between brindobril-based regimen and other ACE inhibitors, like resinobril or enalabril or in a uh, combination of those, you can see those who have 
combine brindobril with other combination therapy like brindobril with amlodipine, there are different better outcome regarding the all-cause mortality compared to those control patients. So comparing other ACE inhibitor like lisinopril, enalopril, and others to brindobril plus combination therapy, and especially in advanced trial, we have brindobril with indomamide. We can see that all of them is really away from the equity line here and improving the outcome. And if you look at other ARB studies, they have different results. So there is no really uh, that to say that ACE inhibitors are better than ARBs in patients who are diabetic and hypertensive. And this is really a meta-analysis, which we have all the studies in diabetic comparing ACE to ARBs. We can see that all cause mortality is better with ACE compared to ARBs. Here we have 23 studies. And here we have 13 studies in ARB. All of them show that all cause mortality is better with, with ACE. Cardiovascular death, again, improved with ACE, but not with ARBs. Major cardiovascular event, again, is improved with ACE, but not with ARBs. And myocardial infarction, again, improved with ACE, but not with ARBs. So the question why? Why is this really happening? Why we have better uh, outcome with ACE compared to ARBs? Now, let's go now to the basics. As you know, angiotensin gene, gene is, a, is a molecule that is found in, in the liver. And the renin comes from the kidney, and this really breaks down the angiotensin gene to angiotensin A1. Now, this angiotensin A1 is then reverted to angiotensin A2 by the ACE. Now, once we have blocking of this ACE, we are looking at higher level than the receptor here. And we're allowing the, 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 the bradykinin to be saved. So basically, if you have more bradykinin in the system, you protect the heart, you protect the vessels. But if you have less bradykinin, this will be reflected in your vessels. Now, ARBs, we have different receptors. To ARBs mean a judicial receptor blockers. We, the one we are using now, they block A2, 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 one only, a transient receptor blocker one. And this, if we don't block it, it will lead to more adrenal release. It will be, lead to more inflammatory response. It will lead to more aldosterone reduction and will lead to uh, less sodium and nitrogen oxide uh, uptake. While if we leave this receptor uh, upgraded, they don't really have anything to be reacted with. So ACE increased availability of bradykinin, which is considered to be cardioprotective, involved in the production of uh, nitroxide, which lead to vasodilation. ACE as well ensure that a utensil supply receptor 2, 3 are also inhibited. These receptors are in fact overstimulated by ARPs. And you can see that here, if we compare different ACE, starting from brindobril, to quadribril, to ramabril, to enalobril, to fizinobril, to captobril, you can see that the one which is really have most inhibition, it come by brindobril because it's lipophilic and it's work on the tissue ACE. And the, the brindobril basically bring the bradykinin back to the normal level compared to the placebo. In the urban trial, we're using brindobril 10 milligram we can see that in health subjects, the level of the, the, the bradykinin came back to the baseline compared to the placebo. ACE inhibition with brindobril reduced death cell. We have less apoptosis and the, the, the improved the life of the endothelium. And this will be protecting against acute coronary syndrome and cardiovascular mortality. If we compare now the, 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 the recommendation by the European Society of Cardiology on how we treat hypertension, we need a drug that exerts its effect over 24 hours. I have seen in, in the, the 24 hour pressure monitoring, we should cover the night period where we have this dipping, unless we have a drug which reacts throughout the day. And you can see that brindobril, amlodipine, and endobamide as a non side diuretics, they are the only one in this list here compared to the hydrochlorothiazide, the xenobril, inalibril, and ramabril, 
that acts through 24 hours. From the angiotensin uh, receptor blocker, Tilmisartan and Ormisartan are, and Alozartan act for from between 70 to 80 to 100 percent of the time you're throwing through the 24 hours. So we can see that the value of combination therapy in RAS has been really with the, the addition of calcium channel blocker as well as in diuretics. So why we have this combination therapy? Because we have synergy at molecular level. We have the ACE working on the endothelium and the calcium channel blocker at, at one on the muscular part of the vessel. And these together will lead to combined effect and more synergy in outcome for patients for better control for 24 hours and preventing the side effect of the long-term therapy. Now, we have that data from ASCO trial. We have reduction of the cardiovascular mortality, comparing amlodipine and bronzobine combination to atenolol thiazide. So diuretics plus atenolol compared to amlodipine plus brindobril, we have better cardiovascular outcome. And not only that, all cause mortality as well has improved when we compare atenolol to uh, amlodipine and brindobril combination. Again, if you look at different endpoints, selected endpoints with ASCO trial, again, you can see non-fatal MI, total coronary endpoint, total cardiovascular endpoint, and new acid diabetes, uh, post hoc analysis of revascularization, all to be shown to be really positive and supporting the use of this combination of amlodipine plus brindobril compared to the atenolol plus thiazide diuretics. Now, if we take out, talk about the, 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 the uh, sorry, let me go back here. If we look at different subgroup, diabetic, obese, metabolic syndrome, renal impairment, all really improvement in the outcome, all these subgroups, smoker, vascular patient, uh, uh, those with hypertrophy, those who are over the age of 60, those who are renal impairment, all of them showed that brindobrine and rhodobrine has improved the outcome. And now, brindobrine plus uh, brindobrine as well decreased the risk of stroke by 29%. So, ASCO trial for up, up to 16 years, you can see that we have 29% reduction. Uh, and really, this has shown up to a follow up 10 years that there is a really significant reduction in stroke. So, patients who are in combination therapy should stay on it for years and to control the blood pressure and we should not really shift because the benefit came out at a later stage. So the question will be which ACE and diuretic combination should be used. I don't prefer to use diuretics like furosemide because they are the only used for heart failure patients and not used for severe hypertension to be controlled if they don't have heart failure or volume overload. We should really use a diuretic which has been proven to be effective. And if you look at indibamide, is there any properties metabolic neutrality? They don't have any effect on other. So American Diabetic Association recommend to use endobamide or clarithridone over the hydrochlorothiazide. So as I said, the, 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 uh, the American uh, uh, Diabetic Association has endorsed combination of brindobrine and dobamide. And this came from the advanced trial, which I already mentioned that in this trial, more than 10,000 patients, diabetics showed that combination of brindobrine plus dobamide improved outcome. And the uh, European Society of Cardiology uh, and European Society of Hypertension recommendation, again, in dobamide, our clarithidone should be used as has shown in randomized controlled trial to have cardiovascular benefit and they're basically more potent and have longer duration action and they are better outcome. Now, if you look at the advanced trial again, you can see the, the combination in diabetes had improved or reduced all hormone mortality in patients who are being used after the first 
18 months from their use, the curve start to diverge compared to the placebo and the mortality has been improved in diabetic patients. So all-cause mortality has been shown to be improving up to 10 years full up as well as cardiovascular death. And this has been endorsed by the American Diabetic Association. So in conclusion, our colleagues that hypertension, unfortunately, is a major risk factor for mortality worldwide. A reduction in mortality is the ultimate goal for our treatment management. And according to the new studies and meta-analysis, ACE inhibitors definitely have severity. And adding uh, brindobreed to amlodipine, we have, or endibamide, we have major scale trials to show that it's reduced both mortality and mortality. And really, this has been addressed by different society and have been shown to be benefits for such patients. Thank you very much now, and I will uh, basically stop my share and uh, move to our last speaker, Professor Saeed of Khudr, and he were really well known. Uh, he is basically working at uh, Al Habib uh, Center. Uh, he is really highly educated, he is trained, and uh, he basically consultant and uh, endocrinologist uh, physician from Edinburgh. And he's working with us now, and he's calling us from Edinburgh now. He's really there now. And hopefully, we'll enjoy his talk about telemedicine and how we can control our blood pressure in such an era of COVID where we have to see patients at a distance. Professor Saeed, please. Thank you very much, Professor Muhammad. And I would like first to thank Sherve for inviting me to give this lecture. Certainly, I'm very glad that uh, Professor Muhammad and Professor Abdel Halim give an excellent lectures and make life easy for me. Certainly, I'm not going to speak much about hypertension, but certainly hypertension, the diagnosis is just to measure the blood pressure. So you don't need to do blood tests. So the most important things is the diagnosis of hypertension and to control the blood pressure. As Professor Muhammad and Professor Abdel Halim showed clearly that unfortunately 50% of our patients undiagnosed 50% are unawareness, 50% of those not treated, and basically we are not doing a good job. Why is that? Probably also we are not measuring the blood pressure in a proper way. Why do we need to check the blood pressure? I mean, Professor Arafi, he mentioned it clearly, the cardiovascular impact, etc. And in the pandemic, we start to realize how to contact our patient, how to check the blood pressure. It's impossible to bring the patient two to three times to check his blood pressure. And even we know that there is other problems in, com in the patients coming to our clinic and the white coat syndrome as well. So why monitor blood pressure? I mean, we know that there is undoubted and well proven benefit and being clearly from the previous speakers, Professor Muhammad and Professor Abdel Halim, that there is well proven benefit in reducing mean blood pressure in patients with hypertension to prevent cardiovascular event. And Dr. Muhammad was clearly said we are dealing with a human being with a lot of risk factors, very, very few patients who have only hypertension. The majority, they have other problems. And also they mentioned clearly that we need to reach a target to prevent the cardiovascular mortality and comorbidity. The other things which Dr. Abdel Halim also mentioned about the blood pressure variability, which is very, very important. And recent study and a lot of studies before, and my colleagues, the cardiologists know better than me, that the blood pressure variability also affect the comorbidity and probably increase mortality. So if we reduce the blood pressure variability, we can prevent vascular outcome, which is exactly as if we can have a blood glucose. If we prevent the blood glucose variability, also it can prevent vascular outcome. So it's important how to do that. So now we are in pandemic stage. The patient is not coming to the clinic, and sometimes we are asking the patient not come to clinic because of the COVID-19. We are busy with the, the pandemic problems. And the other patient that the patient has a fear not to come to the clinic. He doesn't want to come to the clinic to check only blood pressure because, as Professor Araf said, that hypertension is asymptomatic disease. Why to go? Why to check my blood pressure? I'm fine. So there is now the telehealth or telemedicine or mobile medicine. And this telehealth being, the, being uh, the, uh, known and 
there is a definition, okay, by the WHO that telehealth or healing at a distance, remote, the delivery of healthcare services using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment, and the prevention of disease. Not only for hypertension, it's important for a lot of other diseases. I'm not going to go in details, including diabetes, respiratory problem, kidney problem, heart failure, etc., and also for the continuing education of healthcare provider, as we are doing now, lectures, virtual lecture, all in the interest of advancing the health of individual and their communities. This is the definition from the WHO. So telehealth now is growing. Telehealth now is a big business and it's growing in the market wherever you are, in Saudi Arabia, in Europe, or other parts of the country or of the world. So types of telehealth, there are plenty of things regarding the telehealth. There is life, which is real time. There, some of these telehealth store and forward, for example, good for rural area, electronic health records can be stored and sent to us. For example, in Scotland, there is a lot of rural area, islands and remote areas. Nobody can reach it. There is, they can store all the information about measuring blood pressure, their weight, oxygen saturation, uh, respiratory rate, etc., and they send it, and we store it electronically. There is remote patient monitoring, collection of personal health data, which is then sent electronically to the physician. And there is also mobile health, which Professor Abdel Hari mentioned briefly about the mobile, we can use it. So it's very important. We need the technology. We need an internet, okay? And we need the technology, which is regarding a computer, laptop, your mobile, which is a 3G or 4G, and you need certain apps as well. So mobile phone-based remote patient monitoring system for management of hypertension in diabetic patients. I found just recently there is a lot of studies, and this is in 2007, and they conclude that if we use mobile phone-based remote patient monitoring system for management of hypertension, is it probably better than bringing the patient to the clinic. So there is evidence-based medicine. The other thing which is recently approved by the FDA, something called BioBeat, and this is a, a new technology that and been approved by the FDA recently, and this is just recently in 2019, that we use a batch, certain things, okay, and watch to measure, and this watch, measure the blood pressure, oxygen saturation, heart rate, okay, we can use it in hospital, in a clinic, in long-term care, and at home. And also we use, probably some of you have this watch, which is the Abel, the uh, using barrel with the iPhone, you can even do an ECG. One of my friends, he is in Riyadh, and he had a special, simple watch, he himself has chest pain while we are walking in Princess Street before Ramadan. He did the ECG. I looked at the ECG. There was an ST elevation. Immediately he went to Al Hamadi Hospital and his life being saved by Dr. Hussam Ramah at that time. He did cardiac cat immediately. Without probably his watch, we start to say, Are you going? Are you having indigestion? But saved his life. The other things with this new technology now, even if you are in an area, remote area, with sending this information to the physician or to a clinical uh, center or a clinic, sometimes if you are in a mountain or in the desert and you have GBS on your watch, then the ambulance will come to your place, even if you are unconscious or you have no phone, you couldn't contact the emergency. So it's very, very important to consider telehealth or telemedicine. There is advantage and disadvantages for telehealth. The advantages, which is access to information, ability to provide care, not previously found or delivered, improved access, improved education, screening. So the patient can diagnose that he has hypertension. He can measure his blood pressure and doing other things, but he can make the diagnosis. So probably the awareness will increase and probably we are going to have more and more diagnosis for those patients as Dr. Arvin mentioned, that, or Dr. Abdel Halim as well, 50% are unaware that they have high blood pressure. It's asymptomatic. So probably by using this technology at home, we can do more diagnosis and discover more patients. And also it reduces cost. 
There is no need for the patient to come to the clinic. There is no need even to pay for the fees, especially if he has no insurance. It's just important. The disadvantage, I'm not going to speak about the ethics, but certainly the breakdown, we need the patient to be educated, able to use the technology, also the quality of information, not always right, access to communications. It's important that he has internet all the time, that he has not to be interrupted, and also there is some patients, if they are not educated, then it will be difficult probably to organize and when to measure his blood pressure. And sometimes if we ignore those patients, they might treat themselves, which is again disadvantage. Blood pressure management sources of error. Sometimes we have error due to manometer. Okay, and Dr. Abdel Halim, he showed, I mean, how to measure blood pressure. Error due to cuff error due to observer, error due to the patient. So basically now with the telemedicine and somebody and the patient himself or this uh, ex-human that is checking his blood pressure at home, okay, using the new technology, not depending on mercury and not depending on electronic machine that's probably not been calibrated in the hospital. And without even the cough, as we spoke recently, that recent study showed that they can use a batch now, okay? And this is, you don't need to worry about the cuff size. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, Dr. Abdel Halim, he showed nicely when to do it, that it is important and we use it, but it is expensive. When to use the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, if you have a patient, question mark, borderline hypertension, white coat syndrome, nocturnal blood pressure, resistant hypertension, if the patient have hypotensive symptoms, etc., and Dr. Araf showed clearly that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is very good to discover a lot of things and probably to have better treatment of patients with hypertension. But again, the ambulatory blood pressure, he should come to the hospital, we should fix the machine, and there is a lot of the problems, and it is annoying sometimes for a lot of patients. They said the cough was not dry, wake me up at night, uh, etc. And we should ask the patient when you check ambulatory blood pressure, when you fix it, that he should continue normal activity to be maintained. One of my patients, when I did it for him, he slept more than 16 hours. So he came, his blood pressure was fantastic and it wasn't the real life. Uh, the other things, which is again a problem that working days not compared to recreational days, even other environment, Dr. Abdel Halim said even the temperature can affect the blood pressure variability. So it's not as good as home blood pressure monitoring. But about home blood pressure monitoring, the advantages, gives patient empower. Now everybody speak about patients in power in taking even decision, not only in just hypertension, in diabetes, in heart failure, and kidney, because it's his life. So we are giving the patient in power to check his blood pressure. He will feel that I'm doing something for my health. He is more aware, make a diagnosis. He will check if he's reaching the target or not. So gives patients in power, may improve medication adherence. Yes, why my blood pressure is high? I'm checking once or twice a day. So probably the adherence to medication will increase. Device used must be validated. So we cannot say to the patient, go and buy a machine from the pharmacy. So we have to educate and the machine or the device should be validated. Multiple daytime recording over seven days, it's important. This probably is going to eliminate the white coat syndrome or the white coat hypertension because he's at home and he's a We have to educate him when to check his blood pressure. First 24 hour reading should be discarded, okay? Probably after that. Home measurement usually lower than clinic readings, and I'll come to that. So telemedicine and monitoring high blood pressure. So remote patient, okay, remote patients monitoring. The advantage again here, because we know that hypertension up to now that commonly poorly controlled, sometimes over treated that the patient has side effects from this and we are giving him three or four medication. He might develop hypotension and we don't know unless he check his blood pressure at home. But they might come say, I have dizziness or I feel dizzy. I'm a, we can avoid fall, which is common, especially in elderly because he had, he been over treated and has hypotension. So it's important. So the other things we might eliminate white coat syndrome and the other things we are going to reduce the cost, so there is beneficial 
okay, that we are decreasing the cost. The other things, poorly managed avoidable cost to health service, which is very, very important. So we will have better blood pressure control, better adherence, patient empowered, not expensive, very cheap, and is going to save a lot of money and saving money not only for the patient, even for the health service and the government. The other things, especially these days in the pandemic, we are going to eliminate the travel difficulties, okay? Especially in the elderly or if the patient coming from outside Riyadh or outside the capital coming to your clinic, and the other things because of COVID-19, we need this, this, they need this social distancing. Uh, he should be two meters away. We are not sure about the room where they check the blood pressure is overcrowded. So we can even prevent the pandemic. We can decrease the incidence of COVID-19. The other things which is very important now to know there is a lot of technology. The measurement devices nowadays, it's not a cough, okay? It can be implantable biosensor, blood pressure cuff, we can see it, design it. And we have also other things that we can measure because the patient not only have hypertension, so we can measure his blood pressure, we can measure his oxygen saturation, pulse oximeter by his watch. The other things we can ask him to measure his weight and send all this information to the physician, either on the computer or even to the physician's mobile phone. And this, it is very, very important because this will prevent all this COVID-19 or coronavirus infection. And also, we are going to reach those patients, they have a fear from coming to the clinic. So we are not because a lot of patients, diabetic and patients with kidney problem, hypertension, even those patients with acute coronary syndrome, as probably you know, the Professor Arafat and Professor Abdel Halim know very well that the number of cases in Italy, for example, one of the studies, admitted to the hospital with acute myocardial infarction, it dropped by 25%. Not because the acute MI decreased, no, because of the fear. They don't want to come to the hospital. Again, this is important that we are going to over-treat uh, hypertension. We will continue the adherence, and we are going to check if the patient have a the, if he reached the control or the goal of his blood pressure. For example, this is a device which is very easy, which is very simple, and probably everyone probably have it. I have one. It might check the blood pressure, pulse rate. And also, this is the BioBeat, which is available in a lot of countries in Europe and the state, checking the blood pressure, pulse, and oxygen saturation. Even certain smart mobile phone now, you just put your finger and you check the pulse rate and the oximeter, which is very important, oxygen saturation. Okay, I'm not going to go in details because Professor Arafa mentioned and Professor Abdel Halim regarding the differences between the ambulatory blood pressure, home blood pressure monitoring, and the clinical measurement in the clinic. Is there any evidence, is there any study that showed that blood pressure measurement or uh, remote blood pressure measurement at home is okay or not? Telehealth intervention to improve hypertension control. And this is, I tried my best to find out. This is from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. Look at here that recommendation for telehealth intervention to improve hypertension control. Telehealth strategies can be useful adjunct to intervention shown to reduce blood pressure for adults with hypertension. So the recommendation now is becoming really strong. It's very, and probably recommended now, by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and in United Kingdom here, they use it the primary care, especially for the rural area, and now they use it more and more in the pandemic era. I'm not going to this because Dr. Abdel Halim, he mentioned how to check the blood pressure. Unfortunately, up to now, up to now, in most of the physicians, the clinic, I mean, the nurse, they don't know how to check the blood pressure. And it is very important to know that the patient, as Dr. Abdel Halim mentioned, he should not talk, empty his bladder, support back, it's important, etc. And now with the new technology, I'm not going to worry much about the cuff size and about all these things. But it's important to educate the patient who is going to check his blood pressure at home to follow these instructions. So the correct cuff size, if you still use the cuff, don't talk. Empty bladder is very, very important, okay? Support back feet, 
leg should be uncrossed and support arm at the level of the heart. It's important and the cuff size. So when we ask the patient to check blood pressure at home, we have to educate him. How to measure blood pressure, it's very, very important. So patient training should occur under medical supervision. So we can't ask the patient, take the device and go home. We have to educate him. Can we educate him over the phone? Sometimes, yes, but now we have in Al-Habib, for example, telemedicine, which is called life care. So I can speak to the patient, I can see him, and he can see me over Skype, for example, okay, on the internet, on the computer, and I can educate him to some extent. If we find it difficult, we can ask him to visit the educator or visit my clinic. So information about hypertension, we can through the telehealth, Okay, through the phone, WhatsApp, I can speak to him on the internet. Selection of equipment, we should be careful which to select, to be validated, to be also licensed. And how to interrupt, we have to tell him the numbers, which is the target for him, okay? Again, according to the cardiologist or the physician who is treating, if he has very high risk, if I need the target to be 120, or I need the target to be 140. So we have to educate the patient and tell him the number that we need when he checks his blood pressure. So the device is very, very important when we choose the device, especially in the, a lot of technology. It's important to be this device validated, automated device, very important. Also preferably use a monitor that can store reading. Okay, so he can store the readings for a week or two weeks then send it to the clinic. It's important also to verify the cuff size, very important. Also, we need to know, and probably Dr. Abdel Halim mentioned, Dr. Arfi, regarding the blood pressure, to check the blood pressure on both arms, okay, and then take the one on the higher one, okay? And if the difference is more than 20, probably it's better to see the cardiologist or the physician who is treating, but it's important to ask the patient which arm to check after checking on the left and right, and then choose where the blood pressure is the higher reading. Okay, these are the information we have to teach the patients, very, very important, as I mentioned, to be quiet, avoid the smoking, okay, uh, it's important to be sitting in the, in the position that we're going to teach him. It's important, so I'm not going to uh, repeat again. But it's important even at home to take multiple readings, okay, not only one reading, at least more than two and one minute apart, okay, in monitoring before any medication to be considered to increase or decrease. There is differences, and this is important, this is probably for the physician, but if the patient is going to measure it at home, and this is remote blood pressure monitoring, it's important to give him the reading, okay? How much is the blood pressure at night? We know it is good to have the nocturnal dipping, okay? If the blood pressure at night is high, this is probably poor prognosis. So again, we need to give him certain numbers, and what does it mean for the patient? Is there any problem with the current problem in home blood pressure monitoring? Yes, the device, as I said, it's very, very important to be sure that the device is validated and the patient know how to use it. The observer, the patient, or his relative, because sometimes there may either misreporting or bias. The patient, some of them said, my blood pressure was fine all the time. So we have to be careful. We have to trust the patient, but again, we have to put a question mark sometimes. Variable monitoring. When did you check your blood pressure? So he should keep the record. Did you check it when you wake up? Is it after you immediately enter the house while you are smoking? Is it at night? So it's important. And this is again probably a, a variable monitoring. It's a slight problem. Data summarizing, it's important if the patient himself put a diary, but with the new technology, he can store all this information, all these readings on the machine, and he can send it to the physician. I'm not going to go in the clinical indication for home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory, although it's important, but certainly Dr. Abdel Halim, he mentioned all these things. Is there anything in the literature? Okay, I tried my best, but because of the time to show you some of the studies, yes, there is plenty of studies in the literature support the importance of blood pressure monitoring at all. There is here systematic review and meta-analysis effect of remote monitoring of blood pressure in the management of urban hypertensive patients. Again, and also another study impact of home blood pressure 
daily monitoring and the blood pressure control, all these studies in the literature, conclusion from these studies that home blood pressure, daily monitoring may represent a useful tool to improve blood pressure control. However, heterogeneity of published studies suggests that well-designed, large-scale, randomized control studies are still needed to demonstrate the clinical usefulness of this technique. So still we need more and more because this is a new thing. But I'm sure in the near future, all of us will depend on the telemedicine or we are going to use it more and more. Again, more and more here, more studies. There is a study here that self-measured home blood pressure in predicting ambulatory hypertension. Our preliminary data suggests that a lower self-monitoring home blood pressure threshold should be used to exclude white coat hypertension or the office hypertension and being proved that if we use home blood pressure, we are going probably to eliminate uh, the overdiagnosis of the patient. There is uh, the rationale and design of reduction of uncontrolled hypertension by remote monitoring and telemedicine, a remote study, a big study. Okay, again, this is what they conclude, okay, that hypertension care with telemonitoring and telemedicine are expecting to require shorter time to achieve home blood pressure control compared to usual care. So we are going to achieve the target. Professor Arafa, he said very clearly that we, we don't need to wait six months and one year. Probably we need to achieve a good control within a few weeks or a few a few months, not a year, so we can prevent the comorbidity and we can prevent cardiovascular mortality. So combining home blood pressure telemonitoring with telemedicine may lower the hurdles for starting and persisting to hypertension treatment and eventually reduce cardiovascular event. So it's very, very clear that from the studies available now in literature, especially with this study, remote study, that there is a benefit from using or from home blood pressure monitoring remote and using the new technology, the telemedicine. And again, there is plenty of a study and meta-analysis here, all with considering home blood pressure monitoring and in using the new technology to communicate with the patient, not only in pandemic area, even without COVID-19 pandemic. So in conclusion here, high blood pressure can have catastrophic effect on health, and often it is poorly controlled, as it's been shown by Dr. Arafa and Dr. Abdelhaim very clear, it showed you. Taking a blood pressure in the clinic has disadvantages of white coat syndrome, a travel, infection, risk. It is unnecessary to visit to the hospital to just check the blood pressure. There is no need to ask the patient come every two weeks to check your blood pressure. Again, it's a hassle. It's really put them at risk. It costs money. So why to bring the patient every two weeks or every month to only just check blood pressure? We might bring him to check his blood test. Even the blood test now, we have service, for example, in Al Habib and other hospitals. We can send the nurse when we have COVID-19 or pandemic to do the necessary blood test while the patient is at home. So it's important. Telemedicine, many forms, including remote blood pressure monitoring, Patient take blood pressure at home, results sent to the physician. And again, the other advantage that he can restore, that he can store all the data for a week, for a month, for years, and probably can do studies from this technology. The studies show benefits to telemedicine. There is a clear evidence base that using home blood pressure monitoring and other things. Now they use telemedicine in diabetes, in hypertension, in even rheumatology, respiratory, heart failure, kidney failure, etc., which is very, very important. And in the UK here, I heard a lot of stories, fantastic stories, that because the patient is not coming, we have to follow this patient. A lot of patients, my patient, the diabetic patient or patient with diabetes, have poorly controlled diabetes because he's not coming to the clinic. A lot of them, they might have coronary acute syndrome and they didn't come to the hospital. So probably using telemedicine, the patient will have empower, we have better communication, the doctor and the patient will probably communicate more, and we are going to achieve probably better control of hypertension and probably diabetes and other chronic problems. So moving forward, we need to improve home monitoring devices patient can use and further studies needed. And as I said, 
FDA recently uh, approved this biomed that a watch symbol you can use to check blood pressure, pulse rate, oxygen saturation. We can ask the patient to use a glucometer to check his blood glucose, to check his weight, etc. store it and send it to the physician. What is the current phase of health monitoring? This is last slide. Health monitoring is no longer for physician or hospital. It is no longer for people with the chronic diseases. Monitoring for all ages, we can use it for pediatrics. We can even use it for patients to treat patients with psychiatric problems. So the psychiatrist can use it. The specialist nurse, heart failure nurse, kidney failure nurse, diabetes nurse, they can use all these things. People showing interest in self-diagnosis before spending time to the doctor. So because we give them the empower. So they can tell you that doctor, I have high blood pressure because I measure it three, four times at home. Cost effective, we can save money for the patient and for the government. And these devices are fantastic, sophisticated. At the watch, you can use it, simple, and quickly to be learned. And certainly we need a better internet and better network. The other things probably are going to communicate more and more with our patient. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saeed, for this very important and very informative talk. Now, we open the floor for discussion and questions. And uh, I'm going to start by asking uh, Dr. Abdel Harim about the use of beta blocker in hypertensive patients, uh, because as we know, we're not coming to across it, and we'd like to know whether really hypertensive patients should be, can be used beta blocker and when we can use them. Dr. Abdel Harim. The recommendation in the guideline to use beta blocker only if there is specific indication for it, namely ischemic okay. heart disease, heart failure, or younger woman, for example, who was planning to go for pregnancy. So this is really uh, the indication in the guideline for the beta blocker. So if we have patient with heart failure, ischemic patient heart who uh, ischemic heart disease, woman, and patient who no. So what, what about the, the, the patient who has thematic, thematic overdrive, like they have the tachycardia, the exactly. patient? Yeah. With the stress, young patient with very much stress, uh, this is again another indication for it. Yeah. Mean. So uh, beta blocker definitely has a role, but should not be used at first line, second line, or third line. It depends on you know, the patient profile, and as you heard from, from Professor Abhanim. Fair enough. What about uh, DASH diet uh, and lifestyle modification? You stress on the lifestyle modification. How about the DASH uh, diet uh, way? I think it's very important that, is, uh, as we mentioned in hypertension, we don't look only to one factor. There is many factors that is contribute. Reducing weight by one kg will reduce your blood pressure by two millimeter mercury. So if you reduce five, then, then you, the pressure of 150 will become 140. 140 will become 130. So a DASH or any other diet is, is really very important. We should always encourage patients to reduce their weight. Uh, Professor Arfa mentioned yeah. nicely about bariatric patients when they have the surgery. Uh, I really have a couple of patients who become hypotensive actually post surgery and they have to stop all the antihypertensive treatments. They were in three antihypertensive treatment both bariatric surgery, they become off treatment. And I think this is very important to, to focus on the diet and reducing salt in particular is also a very important uh, thing to remember. And this will have, of, of course, have to be combined by uh, the exercise, the exercise for 20 minutes, which is, again, will improve the patient uh, health profile. Uh, Dr. Said, uh, one question is about repeated measurement of blood pressure from one arm at the same time. Is this really will be a good method? Say it again, to check blood pressure on one arm? Yeah, repeated measurement of blood pressure in the same arm. No, we should not do this. I mean, we always, we have to ask the patient. I mean, first of all, if regarding the, if the patient is not in the clinic, We'll speak about that he is at home. We advise him to first time, I mean, that we have validated device, the blood pressure device is okay, to check the blood pressure on both arms and take the blood pressure, which is the higher, for example, on my left, 10 or 5 millicurie more than the right, so I'll use the left. And we should not measure it every second. So if I check it 
I have to wait probably, if I'm not sure, okay, at least five to 10 minutes before take another one and just leave it. But we can repeat the blood pressure two to three times, four times during the daytime at home without any problem. And sometimes we take the average reading. But the most important things, when to check the blood pressure, you should know and to check it probably. If we are using the cough to be the, nor the size that we advise him, depending on his weight, okay? And the other things, as I mentioned, and Dr. Abdel Halim, that he's sitting at least 10, 15 minutes, relaxed, not to cross his leg, to empty his bladder, etc., not to smoking. But I mean, I will not advise somebody to check the blood pressure, keep the cough, and then re keep repeating. Okay. Uh, Dr. Abdel Halim, uh, if you start your patient on step two uh, measurement or management for hypertension, how long you would wait before you move to step three? Okay. Now, this is an important question, and uh, thank you for uh, really putting it up. Now, for the low risk, you can wait up to six months, but for the high risk, you should not really exceed more than three months. And this is why in the guidelines, they put three to six months. Three for the high risk group and six for the low risk group. Now, uh, again, it depends on patient profile and what is the underlying problem. So we can, uh, if we're talking about uncomplicated hypertension and the uh, patient who's high risk without complication, uh, definitely we have some time. But uh, for patients who are really complicated, like the same example here, if I have a patient with, with, with ischemic heart disease and, and hypertension, definitely I would like pressure to be as low as I can if he can tolerate it. Because the problem here, you know hypertension really a marker of oxygen requirements. The higher the blood pressure, the more the oxygen requirement of the heart, and the more the work of the myocyte will be there. So if I want to really rest the muscle, I want to relieve the heart from any tension, I would be really trying to work my best not to be too fast, at the same time, not to wait too long, because you know, the more you wait, the more the, the problem we might create later if the patient is not. Our problem with the patient is, is really, uh, we have to start, according to my, my, my own practice, to start acutely and good doses. We don't want to start him in a small dose and ask him after three, four weeks to come for another dose, because the problem with this way the patient would not like us to every time he comes to increase the medicine or add another. And this is why the, the combination therapy now say from day one, you can combine two medicine in one pill. If the patient has systolic pressure more than 20 or diastolic pressure more than 10 in his reading. Now, uh, Dr. Abdel Harim again, uh, you mentioned about adding spiralactone for resistant hypertension. Now, can we say we add it to the three combination now I have patient already on calcium channel blocker, and he's taking as well ACE or ARBs, and he's on hydrochlorothiazide or he's on uh, hydrochlorothiazide like diuretics, like endomide. Now I, his pressure is still high. Now, when we I want to add spiralactone, is it really necessary to stop the, his diuretics which he was on and add the spiralactone, or should we go right away with spiralactone on the top of the three combination? No, the recommendation to add is baron lactone the top of the three combination. And now yeah. the beauty of the three combinations, that is you have a single bill that is have the three, like you mentioned in your, okay, nicely in your presentation. So you just, yeah. you have one bill, contain three medication at full doses, and you add this baron to it. Great, great. Now, Can I add something, Dr. Please, please, Dr. Yeah, as endocrinologists, especially in young patients, we worried about secondary hypertension. I mean, I use spironolactone, as Dr. Abdel Halim mentioned, a lot of my patients I use spironolactone, especially in dose resistant. But we have to think of cons as well, hyperaldosteronism. And sometimes because treatment is spironolactone and we are going to miss those patients. So we urge a lot of physicians, especially primary care, and if the patient is young, less than 30, less than 40, and he improved on his spinal lactone, think of hyperaldosteronism. So probably you need to do some sort of investigation in young patients. Great. Because they improve now, and nobody knows yeah. until the patients come in advance. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Dr. Abdelhaim, again, uh, 
the role of calcium channel blocker, the question is why calcium channel blocker are preferred to start first in patients uh, more than 55 years old? When in uh, step two, we give ACE inhibitor to these patients. Uh, doesn't matter, I mean, it matter in, in hypertension management uh, for uh, calcium channel blocker as for the ACE. For, for example, actually, as a matter of fact, in this particular guidelines, the International Society, uh, they did not really uh, recommend a specific medication related to the age. And as a matter of fact, um, in one of the slides, uh, but I passed over it quickly, they said clearly in um, elderly people, patient with a stroke, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, you can start directly whether you go for ACE inhibitor or calcium channel blocker. So it really does not matter uh, the age in this particular guideline. But one of the things which I'd like to draw, the calcium yeah. channel blocker that is recommended is the dihydropyridine, which is amlodipine, yeah. adipine, and, yeah. and, and should not go to uh, non-dihydropyridine like uh, deltaazim and farabamil only if these medication are not available or the patient has some issue with it. But the recommended when they say calcium channel blocker is the dihydropyridine. Okay. Uh, this question for Dr. Saeed, how can we cover all hypertension patients? How can, I mean, how would we can cover everybody? I mean, it is a big problem. I mean, half of them are- I think the problem, I mean, Dr. Abdel Halim, he mentioned that we have more than 1 billion Okay, and I'm not sure how many in Saudi Arabia. It's a very common problem, and special. But certainly, in this pandemic area, okay, there are certain patients they are not coming to the clinic at all, and they are at high risk. So why not to help those patients? For example, Dr. Muhammad, you mentioned very clearly that some patients who are high risk and very high risk, and we need to be sure that they are taking their antihypertensive medication, and they are not. And they are not, and they are reaching the target. So at least, if we consider those patients, and we, if we concentrate on these patients, ask them to have home blood pressure, will be fantastic. So I'm not saying to everybody. If the patient is blood pressure being controlled over the last year, there is no need. But if the patient is newly diagnosed or those with very high risk and high risk, I probably be very happy to ask them to have home blood pressure monitoring and send the data to the physician. It is important. So I'm not asking everyone, all the patients, because you mentioned very clearly that 50% of those, they are not reaching the target. How many patients with high blood pressure reach the target, even with very high risk, even with those with coronary artery disease? Not in your clinic, Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Ahed. Probably 60 or 70 patients are not achieving the target. So we have to concentrate at least on those patients with high risk and very high risk, and patients with diabetes. Because again, patients with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or longer duration type 1 diabetes, I am sure at one stage, because they have high blood pressure, probably they have target organ damage. Nobody checked proteinuria, nobody checked echo. We are not doing routinely ECG and echo for those patients. So those patients, I will encourage them to have blood pressure, home blood pressure monitoring. And it is expensive. It is cheaper than coming to the clinic, and we are going to decrease the incidence of catching infection from the hospital or from the clinics. Uh, Dr. Abdelharim, I want to hear your comment about how we can cover all patients. Uh, I think this is not an easy question uh, because if we have the answer, then uh, we didn't have this webinar today. <laughs> I think uh, prevention is always better than a cure. I mean, the, the idea of, of uh, as you mentioned, lifestyle, lifestyle, we should start any lifestyle management from the childhood. I if think we can, yeah. if I, we I can think, encourage yeah. people to, to stick to, to their lifestyle and stick, I mean, you know, 70% of our patients with hypertension are obese, unfortunately, okay? And once you have obesity, you have hypertension, you have diabetes, you have hyperglycemia, you have everything together. So the, the role here is not for physicians, it's a role for everybody in the, in the society to prevent hypertension. Actually, it's not, we don't want them to wait till they have their first uh, heart attack to come to me or their first heart failure to come to you, or they get, get diabetic and get, Communication and come to the facade. 
Now, the, the idea here, mask management, is not really depends on medicine. It's not depend on, on diagnosis. They are really changing the whole idea of concept of how we can modify our, our lifestyle in the right manner. This is my own view about it. No, yeah. I agree with you, and especially one of the things that is you mentioned, which is I'd like really to emphasize on it, which is the starting at the school age. Yes. Now, unfortunately, our school have the most unhealthy diet. Yeah. Now, if in the sport, they, they, they have only one class per the whole week, which is, uh, I was amazed, like in the past, we use every day in the morning, we have tabura sabah, you know, remember? And we used to run across uh, this, our school. Well, I need to go madrasa and kida. And no more. And this is surprised me. As a matter of fact, I think if we catch these people before they get obese, we're really going to decrease significantly the incidence of uh, uh, not only obesity, but hypertension. It will decrease the incidence of diabetes. And, and what will it be? من شاب على شيء شاب علي من شاب على شيء شاب علي. فهي from the beginning we start about healthy diet, exercise and so on. I think this is very important. Now the other important also the law, the role of the media. أفتح أي جريدة أو أي حاجة تشوف الإعلانات عن الكورة وعن الموسم السياحي وعن الموسم الترفيهي. لكن شوف الأريا المخصصة لل for for the uh, for the uh, medical issues like hypertensive, how to measure, what to do, how frequent, القاتل الصامت. عن جد تجد الداتا is is really uh, مرة spare data. You don't find really and you don't find the access to it. الشيء الرابع انه نحن وير نوت يوتلايزنج حتى السوشيال ميديا، السوشيال ميديا تحصل اخبار السياسه واخبار الفنانين بس ما بنستخدمها زي ما شرح لنا الدكتور سعيد ما شاء الله تبارك الله نايس انه قديش الابلكيشن حقتها. فاي ثينك ذير از ا بيج روم اكشولي سبيشلي في سعودي العربيا اللي الناس تيجي على الواتساب اكبر زمن شو شو دكتور سعيد وين دو وي هابي وين دو وي For your patient with diabetes, at what target of blood pressure you are having? So a diabetic patient, what is the target for blood pressure? I mean, you mentioned it depends. I mean, all our diabetic patients, we hope to achieve a target of less than 130 over 80. Yeah. If a patient has target organ damage, then we need it to be less than that if possible. And as I mentioned, Dr. Afa, even I put a target 120 over 80, I'm not achieving 140. So basically, the target for patient type 2 diabetes, especially longer duration, even if I am in a small clinic and I'm not checking an echo to see if he has lifting cohabitrophy or uh, heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, and I have, I asked, I didn't ask the patient to check even urine to see if he has a proteinuria, I urge everybody for the blood pressure in patients with type 2 diabetes and longer duration type 1 diabetes to be less than 130 over 80 at least. If the patient has more, probably I need it 125 or less than 80. There's one question about adding ACE inhibitors as a prophylaxis for patients who are not hypertensive. We have data to say adding yeah. ACE inhibitor can improve, improve uh, patients, especially with diabetes, improve their outcome. What do you think about it? Yes, I mean, we have a lot of patients, especially with those with nephropathy, not just the protein or albumin, already have an established nephropathy. And after the renal study and the IDNT study, I mean, it's important. We might consider a small dose of ACE inhibitor, even berindobril, 2.5 milligram, trying to improve the microalbuminuria. But now, because we have SGL2 inhibitor, so probably we're not going to use ACE just to avoid postural hypotension. So using SGL2 inhibitor as nephroprotective, will probably try to SGL2 inhibitor before using ACE these days. But before that is right. But we have to be very careful. Small dose and titrate and avoid hypotension. What do you think, Dr. Amthani? Do you really add any ACE or ARB in patient with diabetes and borderline hypertension? Uh, I think this is, um, has a multiple advantage. Not only for the blood pressure, which might be that um, uh, important, but also to decrease the proteinuria, decrease the incidence of the stroke, decrease a lot of uh, the cardiovascular event. And I think this is why in the heart failure, we have a stage A, stage B, stage C, and a stage D. And stage A and stage B, these are the stages before they reach to us. 
and when, one of the method to prevent them is to do what we call it a prevent remodeling by adding an ACE inhibitor uh, to this patient. Now, Dr. Abd Hanim, uh, what about your blood pressure target in patients with chronic kidney disease? What, what should you what do you prefer for your patient with chronic kidney disease? What's your target for? Less than 130 over 80. Yeah. Uh, our colleague uh, nephrologist always like this patient to be at a higher uh, blood pressure target, but the recommendation for the guideline is less than 130 over 80. The question now about multi-pharmacy. Uh, here they said a cardiac patient often has more than five types of drugs, beta blocker, ACE, diabetic, digoxin, blah, blah, blah. And how can we take it together in one by one with distance time? Dr. Saeed. I mean, <laughs> hopefully we are using now the single bill combination, as you mentioned, you and Dr. Abdel Halim, and hopefully in the near future, we are going to have a lot of medication in just one bill, okay? The multiple, okay? And they are working with it. And in India, it's very common. But certainly, if the patient, he doesn't want to take all of them together, we can ask them to divide them. But the most important things that there is to, for the physician to understand this medication and the interaction between this medication. And you will be surprised how many of our physicians, he doesn't know that diltazim, you can't take it, for example, okay, with beta blocker or digoxin, okay? So it's important to know this medication, and we can. It's not necessary to take them on one go and explain to the patient, because he has empower now to understand and to ask you, what's the benefit of this medication? What is the side effect? And what is, what will happen if I stop it? And you have to answer all these questions. So I will explain to the patient these are important to improve your heart or to prevent coronary artery disease or to prevent the stroke. No side effect. Don't worry about what they are saying in the media it causes erectile dysfunction or whatever. And you can divide them. Something take it with a breakfast, at lunch, and at dinner time. If you explain to the patient, this will increase the adherence. And there is a lot of a study, one done in Dundee here, called the DRAT study, by just communicate with the patient. As a physician or the nurse, we are going to increase the adherence by more than 55%. So we can improve, we can explain to the patient. But you have to answer the question. Yeah. Benefit, side effect, what happens if I don't have my medication? Okay. Uh... Dr. Abd Harim, uh, there is a combined question here about the role of uh, aspirin for primary prevention. One question said, uh, if more than 20% risk of 10 years MI risk, should we not give aspirin as primary prevention? Actually, we mentioned uh, clearly for primary prevention uh, uh, is not recommended. Now, the, question, the second question was speaking about the high-risk patient. And when you speak about the high-risk patient, he most probably have a, a signs of end organ damage. And this is why his risk profile is more than 20%. And in that case, there is a, a, a recommendation of class 2B uh, to give an aspirin. OK, so you risk to ratify your patient. Uh, it should not be used for every patient. If you have high risk profile, you might consider it. But again, the, the, there is definitely benefit of giving aspirin, but the risk of bleeding is higher than the benefit for primary prevention, for sure. Now, another question here. Uh, I have patients in three uh, different antihypertensive treatment. The sodium now is less than 130. How can we uh, manage him? Uh, do you stop antihypertensive or do you ask him to add salt? To his food or replace it by, by what? Dr. Abd Halim? I think it's very important to establish what is the cause of low, low sodium because neither ACE inhibitor or the calcium channel blocker should give you that. If the patient diuretics, you might expect to have a low sodium. But the first line recommendation we said ACE inhibitor or calcium channel blocker. And both of them do not cause hyponatremia. So it's very important to look what is the cause of this hyponatremia before we, we, we adjust or change anything in the medication. And this is a very important step. 
And I think that our colleague, uh, the endocrinologist, Dr. Saeed, will give us a better insight about this. What do you think, yeah. Dr. Saeed? Uh, I agree. I mean, hyponatremia is very common. And a lot of cases, unfortunately, we misdiagnose, for example, of adrenal insufficiency because they thought that this is because of the hypertension. The other thing, sometimes you might have other problems. I mean, SIADH or cortisol deficiency and other medication. We have to review all the medication. We have to check his urea, electrolyte, creatinine again, and not from the first time. I mean, don't depend on just one reading. A lot of mistakes in any laboratory, in Cambridge or Harvard or in Riyadh or wherever. So hyponatremia is common, but not always to blame, as Dr. Abdel Halim said, AC inhibitor or calcium channel blocker. It could be something else. We have to exclude endocrine problems. Sometimes it could be renal arteries. It could be anything. It could be SAIDH. It could be dilutional hyponatremia. I have a patient. He is 30 years old. He been living on just batikh. Okay, <laughs> he doesn't drink anything, and he drinks around the 12 liter of water. He's psychic, and he been to urologists, to physicians, to doctor cardiologists, and everybody treating his hyponatremia with different things. Okay, he has a primary polydipsia, for example. Okay, so we have to investigate. Yeah. Now, uh, Dr. Abdel Hamid, uh, now uh, let's say this. Uh, Regarding the, the checking for carotid Doppler, do we really need to do for all hypertensive patients or those who have some cerebrovascular symptoms? Some, do you uh, recommend carotid Doppler for everybody or just for those who are symptomatic? No, for these people who have a signs or symptoms of progressive atherosclerosis, these yeah. are the people who are recommended for the carotid Doppler. So always check to, uh, nice to check for the carotid Brouille and your cystoscope. Yeah. Just move your cystoscope up a little bit and you might hear something. Now, about telemedicine, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Saeed. Now, patients uh, with positive COVID, they experience a degree of hypotension during their illness. Should we stop their medication for a period of time, especially if they are on hydroxychloroquine? Hydroxychloroquine, yes. I mean, regarding patients with COVID, if he's inpatient, okay, and I'm sure uh, with my experience, a lot of them, they decrease appetite and they decrease weight. So one of the patients, he lost 20 kilogram, 20 kilogram, okay? Of course, after he is losing 20 kilogram, as he's doing bariatric surgery, he doesn't need any of his antihypertensive medication. So when he go home, a lot of patients unfortunately went home discharged. Nobody explained to them anything about their antihypertensive or anti-diabetic drugs. Some of them, they are already discharged on dexamethasone, their blood glucose 600, and they found me what to do because nobody explained. So regarding the blood pressure, first of all, we have to emphasize that we should continue AC inhibitor. It's not contraindicated. Because at the beginning, if you remember, they start to say S and R contraindicate. So it's not contraindicated. If the patient lost weight and is decreasing appetite, we can decrease the dose of his antihypertensive. And if you continue blood pressure is low, I will stop it. And keep an eye on his blood pressure. The question about uh, Brindobril, is it superior to other A's? Uh, from what we know from the the tissue studies, it is basically uh, act 24 hours and it basically will prevent uh, the, the, the tissue is 100% almost. And now we don't have head-to-head -head comparison. So we were talking about, we should be really be careful not to say, uh, unless we see head-to-head -head comparison study to know whether was this medicine is severe to the other. But from what we know about its uh, features, it's very, very helpful to know if you have medicine that works 24 hours for you, it will be more beneficial than the other. The question would be about uh, comparing ACE to ARB. Definitely uh, ACE has a long way to go and they have proven themselves over years to be uh, preventive. The only advantage of ARB over ACE is really to me the, the, the side effect of cough. And cough uh, has been uh, uh, reported in variable percentage uh, I don't know whether, what do you think about Dr. Abhanim about ACE and ARB as comparing them together? I think uh, there is no really head-to-head -head comparison to say um, the difference. 
But what we, uh, we learn actually from the nice slides that you show us is really ACE inhibitor had been quite long time, had been studied in different uh, groups of patients, had been studied for a longer period. And I think this is why we always, all the guideline putting ACE inhibitor as the first line. And then they said, and all. So, so it's not really yeah. the first line to start uh, the art. And I think we should really stick to that. You, there is no single guideline that is starting uh, ARP ahead of the ACE inhibitor. And I think this is very important, uh, message. About the incidence of angioedema, did you see it, uh, Dr. Saeed or Dr. Uh, Abdel Harim? Uh, how common the angioedema you see? Uh, I, I don't know how you've been working 40 years medicine, Dr. Mohammed, probably more than me. I've been working for more than 35 years, but there was one case came to the acute medicine ward where I was on call with a query angioedema to the real infirmary in Edinburgh. I will never forget it in my life in 1997, but there was a big question mark. Is it the ACE or something else? Because we couldn't take history from that patient. I mean, he was on ACE, he was eating something, we are not sure. So this is the only case, but this is in 1997 only. Okay. But uh, we, we have to be careful, we have to ask. Yeah, it's very rare. I have to admit myself, I haven't seen many cases, uh, despite my practice is almost hypertension. Every day practice, we see more than five to 10 patients a day with hypertension. But yeah. it's very rare. And uh, once uh, defined, it should be very clearly labeled and the patient should carry a notice with him that this patient is sensitive to it. And it's really, it could be fatal actually, but thank God, yes, what, about, be, what, yeah. the what did you uh, mean to talk about the One case actually, and, uh, but it was mild uh, angioedema and, uh, and really recovered uh, uh, shortly after we stopped the ACE inhibitor. The question about can brindobril uh, be used as prophylaxis therapy for CAD, CBA, or other illness in borderline hypertension? I think the answer yes, we can definitely. Uh, okay. What about uh, the degree of authenticity effect for a type of treatment? I mean, does authenticity uh, uh, affect your uh, your guidance of treatment, Dr. Ram Harim? If it's a black yeah. uh, African, yes. or if it is Hispanic, or it is white, or if it is Arab, or if it is uh, other? Uh, well, uh, the first part about the black is definitely, and I mentioned that is the, the recommendation, even in the first line, they said you can about calcium, shandrupa, or R plus diuretics in the black people, and, uh, and we said that is because the black are uh, less sensitive to, uh, uh, or have less response to the ACE inhibitor. Now for the different groups, we do not have a local studies, I cannot say, but uh, Saudi Arabia is well known, it's a mixture of different nationalities, different races, and uh, from my limited practice, I did not see any significant difference, but you are, uh, your experience should be more counted. That mind. Uh, definitely, uh, we don't have uh, long-term therapy here management in the kingdom, but we know that uh, most of our patients we see in the clinics are responding to the common therapy. And uh, as Dr. Ram Hing said, those elderly uh, might need special treatment, and Black African need special treatment. But otherwise, we have no questions. The question about stress-induced hypertension, Dr. Abraham. Uh, at time, uh, we, we do stress tests for the patient, and he go on treadmill, and his pressure shoot up to 170 over 100, 110. When he relax down, sit down, his pressure come back to normal. What do you think about this phenomenon? Uh, you got my question? Now for this patient who have a, a, a exercise vertation, am I correct? Yes. When he do stress test, his pressure yeah. goes up to 170, 110. When he go down, sits down, sit down, his pressure is fine. Yeah, I think the approach to this patient is two approach. Now, number one, which is very important, that is these people are 
will known to develop a frank hypertension at later stage of their sure, life. Sure, sure. And this is why it's very important to follow this patient and to check uh, their blood pressure uh, in the future and don't leave them. This is number one. Number two, we can get the help of the other modalities to assess if they really uh, have hypertension at a different stage because maybe during the stress, they, they, their adrenaline wash off and, and they come better blood pressure. But we need to do it at home by home, frequent home blood pressure measurement or by the use of 24 ambulatory pressure. And I think this is one of the indication of the ambulatory pressure in such patient to identify what he's doing at a different situation at home, stress, at the work, at, at the exam, and so on. It's very important, again, even I mean, with doing these two things, is always to encourage lifestyle modification because these people, yeah, even yeah, if, yeah. They, if, if you reduce their weight, reduce their salt, reduce exercise, this will improve their profile. And I, I saw it myself, actually, in certain people who will do it for a different reason. We noted that is when they reduce their weight, they, the next time you do a stress test, the, the hypertensive response become much less than the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question about medication, uh, the role of alpha blocker in, in treatment of hypertension. Uh, actually, we don't use it a lot, actually, because Postural hypotension dizziness is, is very common with alpha blocker. And I would not rush to it uh, uh, unless the patient needs to go for his prostate treatment. And then we, we have to use it with caution, with antihypertensive uh, like other ones. Because, you know, dizziness and postural blood pressure drop is very common with alpha blocker. What do you think, uh, Dr. Harim and Dr. Saeed? Yeah, I think I agree with you. It's only recommended it's as a class in the stage of four of management. When everything did not work, then we can add it to the standard therapy. But uh, the profile, the side effect profile is, is, is really uh, significant and we have to observe for that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it seems to be the nephrologists, they use it more when they have no other options about it from just adding doxazosine, for example. Now, about a young patient in his 20s with hypertension, and he has strong family history of cardiovascular disease. So he's 22 years old, hypertensive, and very significant cardiovascular disease history in the family. What should we do with him? I think... Abdul Halim. Halim, go ahead. I, I think it's, you nicely illustrated that in, in your presentation. That is, we not focus on a figure. And we should really take, take the patient as a whole. We should address all his risk profile. And we have to be very aggressive in his management. Because like, for example, he will be considered as a group not a high risk, will be considered as a very high risk group. So these are the people who you start in combination with all those uh, therapeutic, you have to address his blood sugar, his LDL should be less than 70 or less, uh, uh, less than 1.7. So this is, I think it's very important uh, because they are the one who's going to suffer the more complication. He's at age 20 had all this. Imagine what happened at the age of 40 or 60. So I think they are the one who should really we are very restrict in this. We should target less than 130 over 80. And we have to really to follow closely. We have to, move to, to use all the accessory or surfaces available of uh, remotely checking blood pressure, uh, che involving nurses, involving pharmacists uh, to improve his outcome. Uh, the question about uh, COVID-19, uh, is there any risk of developing hypertension if you get COVID-19, what do you well, think? Not yet. Uh, COVID-19, I mean, probably you mentioned earlier while we are discussing things regarding the, that it affects the heart in 80% and doing MRI. And recently also there is a study that we have to watch those patients because they are at risk of having a stroke and that risk of having a query recurrent pulmonary embolism. But we don't know yet. We don't know what will happen. So we'll see. Yes, uh, Dr. Abdel Halim, uh, how to control and give treatment to patient hypertension with STEMI during COVID? <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> we are patient with hypertension and ischemia. Just... <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think one of the very important that is to clear that is what because I mentioned S inhibitor is nothing contraindicated in this group. This is very important message because people are get confused about it. And now this is the strongest indication for our beta blocker. Yeah. Because we had a question when to use a beta blocker. So now we have ischemic heart disease or acute MI. So now you have the indication to start beta blocker uh, for, for this patient. I think it's very important also in the setting of acute MI always to, to, to ensure that is his high blood pressure is not related to, to his pain. Because controlling the pain itself might, might lower your, uh, your blood pressure. It's also important to understand which type of myocardial infarction you're having. Because if you're dealing with inferior myocardial infarction and you do not fill the patient with IV fluid and you start your antihypertensive treatment aggressively, then he might have a accompanied or associated right ventricle infarction and his prognosis will be poor. I think we have this question, we will come to the end. Uh, it's already uh, 9.35. And I would like to thank Serbia, Saudi Heart Association, uh, Dr. Saeed, Dr. Abdul Hari for a very, very, very interesting night, actually. I learned a lot from them. Hopefully, okay. we can meet together more in the future. Again, sure, thank yeah. for all the support in the meeting, who attended. And we have so many questions. I'm sorry, we could not answer all of them but the time is running out. So if you have anything, you can contact uh, any of the speaker on their private line for more information. Thank you very much and have a good Thank night. Thank you. The best time. Thank you, take care. Assalamu alaikum. Ma'asalam. Ma'asalam. All the best luck.